All right, thank you, Minister. So, Minister, we are going to, there are several entities, and, and I'm mindful of the committee getting full and good quality answers to the entities that we, we oversee and the other portfolio committees oversee. The entities that fall under your portfolio have been troubled in many ways. Transnet is one of them, there is a road accident fund, and so on. And what I thought was reasonable is that we give you adequate time to prepare yourself and your deputy minister to appear before the committee and deal with all of them at substance to do that. And therefore, that is why, and I've had the conversation with you about you coming back here. And so I look forward to welcoming you back uh, to, the, to, to, to the committee. We are going to continue the discussion with the Transnet management because what is clear to me is that Transnet will not meet its mandate if the operational performance does not improve, if the financial performance does not improve, if the legal matters are not resolved, and in, if there are the external issues like your tax issues, uh, the, the issues with the South African Revenue Services, with the South African Reserve Bank do not get resolved but we also need to, having taken account of what the Transnet management is, has shared with us and will share with us today, and the presentation came from your office uh, that Transnet gave or came with your approval, we, we will want to know what are you going to do about the information that we receive today. And so that is, it is on that basis that, I, that you need to come back to the committee so that we can have this conversation at, uh, at, at length. And so, Honorable Skosana, I don't know, is it a question? Yes, I, I just, just wanted to, uh, thank you, Honorable Chair, before the minister leaves, beco before she leaves here, when she said that uh, we know about the State Capture Commission, I can rest assure you there's no holy cow cow here. SCOPA is not, uh, the state is not Zondo Commission. We are going to ask those, those questions because even the Secretary General, that's what he said, that when you want to urinate, you must go to Zondo Commission. So with, with that statement alone, because that was a commission of inquiry, yeah, we want facts, you know, not gossip, gossiping. And I can tell, tell you, I'm not going uh, uh, to shy away from asking a qu qu question because uh, the State Capture Commission has dealt with those matters. We have to deal with matters here. That's right. another body, there's a separation of power. And I guess we have to respect that. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Skosana, the, the same thing I told the <laughs> minister applies to you. I'm the one who determined. I'm the, I'm the one who determined. So please. Thank you. I have not disallowed the question, if you noticed. Okay. I didn't. And so can we not? Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank okay. Honorable Mente. Uh, no, thank you, Chair. No, just one clarity before we release the minister, because we are going to ask the group CE, uh, what does she know about the vetting of the staff? The, the vetting of the executives. Of the executives. The executives before. Yeah. before minister, deal with that, and then we, we will release you. Thanks, Honorable Both the Matt. board and the executive, yeah. uh, what is the status of that as thank far you. as she knows? I will have to ask that question, Honorable Mente. It's not a question that I've asked uh, since my appointment, but I will ask it. Thank you. I am worried that uh, we're going to have interventions. Is this something? Chair, yes, my name is a point of order. It's not a question to the minister. I think there was a ruling already that the minister's going, she's coming back. But I think we just need, I want to say, my point of order in, in, in relation to the previous member but one's comment is that we all know that one of the tasks of SCOPA um, as Parliament is to follow through on all the Zondo Commission reports. I don't think it's helpful if members in this uh, committee um, you know, cast dispersions on the Zondo. It was a commission, yes, but we are charged as Parliament and this committee to go through all the recommendations and to process them. I just want to raise that point. Thank you. Uh, 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 Honorable Dagmar, that's, that's noted. Thank you. Minister, you are a list. Thank you, Chair.
So sh shall we do this? So there was, I wa want to give opportunity to the members of committee that had their, their hands up. Honorable Skosana, we, we've got time. So we will, you will get another, you'll get another bite at it. So I want all the, the members who had put up their hands uh, to, that we complete that round and then the, the Transnet team uh, in the form of the of the of the of the board member and the executive can deal with those questions so because we've got time can i then ask that we ask such questions that we get a full answer because what happens when there are six questions what i've noted happening we get an answer a substantive answer to three questions and the others are not addressed so i am not limiting what you can ask I want us to get full answers on the questions that get asked. So when we ask six, I have to keep note and then see if all six have been answered with each member. Uh, so I think in the, <laughs> no, it was not the Honorable Esak, I think it was Honorable Molife, and then it was Honorable Atkinson, and then it was Honorable Skosana, and then you were getting exasperated that I wasn't seeing you, and then I bonded at you. So that is the order, we've got time. So can, can we go in that order? I will not make interventions, but as I said, please let's try, so, so that we can get a few rounds each. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, welcome, Group Chief Executive and uh, Transnet staff and the board. Uh, Group Chief, you referred to network vandalism and theft. What is the nature of this network vandalism and theft and what are the strategies that um, Transnet is putting in place to deal with uh, network vandalism and uh, theft? Uh, in short, uh, the is the security department being strengthened? Um, what is the use of modern technology like drones in uh, combating uh, network vandalism and theft? And you have referred to intervention in the pipeline vandalism. What precisely is this intervention that you are uh, talking about? Um, the story of Transnet is that between 2017 and 2024, the amount of uh, goods transported by Transnet uh, has declined from 226 million tons to 150 million tons. Incidentally, 226 million tons were achieved uh, in 2017 in what uh, a lot of people call the state capture years. And the 226 million tons had never been achieved before in Transnet and has never been achieved since. I, I heard you refer to debt relating to state capture and so on. But the fact of the matter is that the performance of Transnet was at its best. Incidentally, uh, during those years, the state capture years, as you call them when you refer to the debt, uh, Transnet was profitable. It reported profits between 2010 and 2018. What happened after 2017-18 that Transnet is now making such extraordinary losses? Uh, I mean, a loss of 10 billion rand is not something to be uh, scoffed at uh, from a very profitable situation during the so-called uh, state capture years. You have a target of achieving 250 million tons, which is better, which will be better than the record that has already been achieved of 226 million tons, and we welcome that. But the question is, by when? Because I did not hear that. By when will the 250 million tons be achieved? Is it in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years? When will the 250 million tons uh, record, I mean, uh, uh, 
be achieved. Um, I heard you speaking a lot about improvements and how improvements will be made, but when you referred to the improvements, I did not get a sense of tangible things that are going to be done. Uh, for example, in the ports, uh, we used to have a, an efficiency measure called crane moves per hour. What has happened to crane moves per hour in the different ports, DCT especially, but in all the ports, uh, Cape Town, uh, Moha, crane moves per hour uh, between 2011 to 2018 and then from 2018 to 2024. Uh, crane moves per hour is something that uh, you cannot, you either move 26 crane moves, 26 uh, 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 containers per hour, or you don't. And uh, Transnet had a very elaborate way of measuring this crane moves per hour. Uh, in fact, to the extent that during the state capture years, uh, the uh, tandem lifts were tandem crane at, at, at cranes with tandem capability were employed. Are those cranes still operational? And is the tandem capability still being uh, uh, used? Is it still is it being used? We welcome the pitches of the four cranes for Pier Two in uh, DCT to relieve the pressure. But we had. We also had a very good uh, uh, tandem lift, ZPMC uh, tandem cranes uh, at, uh, in DCT. Honorable Olife, can I ask that we kind of keep some to the next round? Yes, I, I'm, Please. Just, uh, I'm just. Is that the last one? Uh, uh, For now. Penultimate. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I see that operating expenditure is up by 5 billion rand. i just curious to find out what in the operating expenditure increased. What was the single biggest uh, increase item in the operating expenditure? And finally, referring to OPEX, because I said this is my uh, penultimate question. This, it, re it refers to what the minister was talking about, which is maintenance. What was the maintenance spend? in Transnet for both, for rail, for ports, for pipelines, for everything that we were doing there. What was the maintenance spend between 2011 and 2018? And what was the maintenance spend between 2018 and 2024? Uh, and what was the reason for the decrease in maintenance spend? Because I can, I, I have a feeling that it decreased uh, substantially and that is why you are having so many breakdowns. Thank you. Honorable Olife, so I like the way you've asked your last question. Because when you say during the state capture years, I don't want to second guess which years those are. I'm going to give you an opportunity where you use that term. I'm not saying we throw it where you use that term to say which time period you're referring to because there might be reason for the transnet management to pull up the, the same slides they showed us and we need to see. So the way you referred to your last question, gave time periods, please do it f for when you spoke about the state capture years. So, Chair, I don't know what state capture years is. I just had it. <laughs> but you referred to it. No, because, it, because the group chief executive referred to it first when she said that there was a, 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 um, a loans during the state capture years. So I don't know exactly when that was and how it happened. But well, let, for, for, for using it, let me apologize and withdraw it, the state capture years. Let me just rather talk about 2011 to 2018 yeah. and 2018 to 2024, because I think that is where the disjuncture, that is where the, the destruction of value happened in Transnet between 2018 and 2024. Thank you, Honorable Rolf, and I wasn't asking you to withdraw. I just wanted to be clear for my own note-taking. So, but you've clarified, so thank you. No, I voluntarily withdraw. Thank you. So in order for us to do this efficiently, can I propose this? So I've counted the questions. I think we are on about 14 now. If we go through everybody, uh, I can tell you there will be about 16 questions that do not get answered. So can I do this? Uh, 
I ask the Transnet team to respond to the questions asked. Next, what I will do is I will give a member an opportunity to ask questions and ask the team to answer, and then we do it that way. Then, even for the public who may be watching, the interaction is more valuable. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Molefe. I'm going to try to respond. They're quite technical questions. We'll try to keep them as simple as possible. And then I'll have my uh, finance team respond to some of the financial uh, questions. So we do have a breakdown of the uh, 51 billion uh, that we talk about that is required to restore. Ms. Phillips, carry on. Carry on. Can I continue? You don't, unless a member speaks, you know, oh. if they scratch their head or are exasperated, <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm getting used to being in the environment. Um, so we will get the team to respond to uh, the specific financial numbers. Uh, the 51 billion that we require for network restoration, we have a complete back, uh, a breakdown of those numbers. Uh, you'll guide me, Chair. I've got them per corridor. I've got them specific to what is required. Uh, it's quite an extensive list. Um, I think what you, I, I don't think the members were asking you to give an item of line by line, give the committee a sense of what is co composed therein, sort of the major a sort of expense lines within that so that we get a sense and where that is being spent without going, we don't want, certainly don't want to in the context of Transnet about, yes. about five million rand somewhere. Yes. Um, so we've got a 51 billion, that 51 billion is expect, expected to be spent over the next five years. So from the 24, 25 year to uh, what we call the 28, 29 year, um, and in that we have broken it down specifically per corridor. So you have, uh, and we have the detail per corridor as well, but on the North Corridor as an example, for the 24, 25 year there's a 2.4 billion, and that's how we've broken it down. So the, 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 the request was when do we catch up with this 51 billion? The 51 billion is expected to be spent over the next five year period. And then in addition to the 51 billion, we have, um, I think it's a 19 billion uh, for sustaining, because we, we can't only be catching up with, um, with backlog maintenance, we also have to continue to sustain the network uh, moving forward. Then there was a question, and I'm hoping that the team has uh, pulled up the numbers. Um, Mr. Molefe, I can't remember too far in terms of what the, you, you referred to the gross crane moves per hour. Um, when you talked about moves per hour in the container terminals. Yes, yes, yes. that's a very important. The most yes. important thing in a container terminal yes. is the moves per hour, yes. not anything else. Yes, so the gross crane moves per hour is the number of moves that a crane does within the hour. That's essentially what it, what it means. Now, um, and then we, we hope, I'm hoping that the numbers are going to come up. We can talk to the numbers. Um, the terminals across the board are not meeting those, uh, those targets. They're not meeting the performance targets in respect of gross crane moves per hour, neither are they move, meeting. There's another metric, it's called ship working moves per hour. It is a, a combination of the number of cranes that you are actually deploying on a vessel at a particular time and the moves that is done uh, uh, by those cranes in that particular hour. So for argument's sake, a single crane can do, uh, Mr. Malefa mentioned, Honorable Member Malefa mentioned, 26 moves uh, per hour. Um, if you're putting two cranes or three cranes on a vessel, it essentially means multiply by three, uh, removing uh, some factor for um, you know, the theory of constraints, essentially, diminishing returns. So that's how the numbers work out. We will, I mean, we can provide the numbers, I'm hoping it comes through, for the period specifically 2011 to 2018, and then 2018 to 2024. 20, 20, Unfortunately, Chair, I did not expect us to be providing those numbers uh, to the committee today, but uh, it is available. Um, then, uh, Honorable uh, Molefe makes the point, uh, I'm just dealing with the questions that I think I can respond to makes the point about the tandem cranes 
that were purchased uh, for DCT Pier 2. Tandem cranes are cranes that should be able to, under normal circumstances, move four containers at a single time. So can I, so they say in government and, and sources, there's a lot of abbreviations and jargon. So yes. can you, you know, DCT Pier 2, can you oh, just right. yes. say that in full okay. uh, for the members and then, and then you can thereafter? My apologies, my apologies. It is Durban Container Terminal. In Durban, we have two container terminals. The one is called Pier 1 Container Terminal. We uh, established that terminal in towards the end of 2006, 2007. The main container terminal is what we call Durban Container Terminal Pier 2. So it handles most of the volumes, that container volumes that come through the country. In, um, uh, I forget the year, but I think uh, Honorable Malefe will remember, we had purchased uh, seven tandem lift cranes from ZPMC. At the time, there was a case made that if we buy these tandem lift cranes, that it would substantially increase the performance of the Durban Container Terminal. The challenge, uh, Chair, uh, is that when those tandem cranes, it's not purely uh, about buying cranes. You also have to buy the backup equipment that supports these cranes. So when they bought the tandem lift cranes, uh, uh, when you drop, essentially it means you're gonna drop four containers, and then you need backup equipment that's gonna pick up four containers, right? Or you need to have the right. So what we did at the time, Transnet bought uh, twin lift uh, strato carriers that were supposed to, to support that. The challenge is, is when you have a misalignment between your backup equipment and your, uh, crane, your cranes, your craneage, you're not going to get necessarily the, um, the performance that you require. Now, at the time, and in fact, I can speak to it because I did the study. Um, in fact, I was requested to do the study post the purchase as a post-implementation review. Um, worldwide, at the time, the utilization of tandem lift cranes was probably around 22%, worldwide. Um, I'm not sure if that's changed much today, for the most part, container terminals around the world would utilize twin lift cranes. They would try to increase the utilization of twin lift cranes. Twin lift cranes are cranes that pick up two containers at one time. And for the most part, that seems to be this, the, the, the standard. Twin lift cranes will pick up two containers uh, um, at the time. It is then easier to also support twin lift cranes with backup equipment, whether it be uh, uh, rubber tied gantry cranes, RMG cranes, or, or container cranes. So, Mr. Molefe, the tandem lift cranes have not delivered the performance that is expected of it. It is not being utilized to the extent that it should be utilized if you have the necessary equipment to support it, but also if you, because it depends on what is on board the vessel, you have to support, you have to be able to pick up four containers at one time. If they're not all intended for your terminal, you will not be able to pick up four containers uh, at a time. Um, I'm just giving you a, 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 a roundup of uh, tandem lift cranes. Um, can we, uh, the single biggest increase item in, in the OPEX, I believe is the provisions? is the provisions for the litigation for NATRIF, uh, which is the 4.8 billion that we've had to provide for. That's the single biggest. We did also um, have an improve, an, an increase in uh, personnel cost because uh, because our the way the shifts were running, and it's been running like this for many years, we've actually been non-compliant uh, with uh, some employee legislation, which we've had to correct, and we've had to increase our personnel within the container terminals where we started to do that uh, by e employing a fourth shift. So you've seen a, an increase in, in the numbers in the, in the container terminals. Um, the maintenance spend in transit over the period, I'm going to leave that to the finance people to answer. Um, correct me as CFO, but uh, provisions are not part of OPEX, are they? They are, sir. They are part and parcel of operating Because I saw that when you talked about the, uh, the uh, um, EBITDA and the profit, the jump from EBITDA to a low profit was a provision. So in EBITDA, it means that that provision was not in EBITDA. Can I, can I propose this? So, uh, Ms. Phillips, deal with the questions that you, as chief executive, that's why we've got some of your colleagues here. 
Can I then uh, ask that your finance colleagues deal with the financial questions and if there is any matters outstanding, Honorable Molife, trust me, I will give you an opportunity uh, to answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I think I'm going to hand over to the finance people. Chair, also, I think maybe to clear up, um, I, don't, I really do not want to go into debate about the state capture years. We did refer to it as the period known as state capture uh, uh, in inverted commas, Chair. I'll leave it at that, and I'll hand over to the finance team. So my direction is the same as I did to Honorable Molife, which is, if we're going to use that term for the sake of clarity, explain what time period you are referring to so that we don't speculate about which year is included, which year is excluded, and so on. Thank you. Can, can we then get an answer on the, on the financial questions, having regard for Honorable Molife's follow-ups? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Tando will answer the maintenance, but uh, on the EBITDA, uh, I can confirm that the provisions are part and parcel of EBITDA because it should have been an expense that should have been paid under normal circumstances. Hence, then you provide for it. Below the line after EBITDA is going to be your depreciation and your interest cost that will take and also the fair value gains that will take you to the net profit. So in addition to what Michelle has said as well, we also mentioned that there was a 603 million increase uh, on, on, on the security cost. So it was employee cost, the NATREF provision, and uh, the security cost also increased about 603 million. Thank you.